It's already nice to see that. Nice to see everybody out here. All right, I think we should be working. Let's go, YouTube. Okay, we should be live, I think. Let's see, maybe we're not. Are we not live? Someone else posted a comment. Let me see if this is working. Maybe there's a, an error. Okay, we are live. All right, uh, pardon the delay, just making sure this is working over here. I am Drew Badger, the founder of EnglishAnyone.com, and welcome to another live video here on YouTube. This should be an entertaining one. We're going to talk about how natives think so you can do the same thing, uh, because how they think is really the, uh, the secret to their ability to speak. Uh, nice to see you there, George. Who else is that? Uh, Renan and the T family from... Maybe that's uh, Washington over there. All right. All right, uh, this video will not be uh, terribly long. I guess it depends on, on how, how many questions people have. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Uh, but it's actually a pretty simple, uh, pretty simple idea to understand. Uh, but let's just make this very clear. Uh, remember that the, the basic idea uh, that I'm always talking about, especially if, uh, if you are new, I want to make this point again because I haven't really spoken about it in a while. Uh, and this is that you need to understand the language like a native if you want to use the language like a native. Uh, and this just means that if you're thinking through translations and uh, you're trying to, trying to remember grammar rules, it's going to be more difficult for you to communicate, all right? So the, the basic idea of language learning is, is that we want to mirror, let's, we're gonna draw kind of a, a mirror over here. If you imagine this is uh, one side of the mirror, how far can I draw on this? Let's draw a line over here. So we have one side of the mirror over here and we have another side of the mirror over here. So the, this part of the mirror here, we're gonna call this reality. I know this, this won't be like a really deep lesson, but it, it should make sense. Uh, so we imagine this is reality over here, and then this is the, the learner. So this is the mind of the learner over here. And in reality, if you look at the language, uh, what do we see? Now, I guess I could draw this as a kind of an image, but it's a little bit easier if I just list a bunch of things that we see uh, in the real world uh, for language. All right, so if we're in, we're talking about language, we have uh, like a variety. So we have a variety of vocabulary, uh, and we also have a variety. So we're gonna say with this, you will see this theme here a lot uh, for just everyday uh, language learning and language use. So we have a variety of speakers. Okay, uh, and these are also going to have a variety of speeds. So because we have different speakers, people will have different accents as well. So pronunciation could be uh, a little bit different. Vocabulary can be different as well. So if we have a variety of vocab, a variety of speakers, a variety of speeds, a variety of accents, we have all of these different things. It, it looks like a kind of massive network of all these different things that are connected it really it kind of looks like a, like a brain because we have all these different connections there uh, and if we want to be able to understand and speak like this then the way we learn needs to mirror this all right so if we look at the native i'll just put an n over here uh, if we look at how the native learns they're getting all of this stuff so they're getting the variety so the variety of vocab they're getting a variety of speakers. They're getting a variety of speeds and accents and any other kind of variety that you would get in everyday life, all right? So just to make this a little bit more clear for people, if you think about your native language and how you use that, you walk around the city where you live or the country or any place like that, uh, but you will hear likely different speakers, 
Okay, so it could be different people in your family or your town or your city, your school, your job. You'll have all of these different people who speak a little bit differently. Okay, and because this is the reality of the language, you're, you're getting exposed to that same reality as a native learner. All right, and so the mind of the native learner, they get used to this kind of speech. So you have lots of different speakers, different speeds, different accents. You get used to all of that different speech. All right. So this is incredibly important to help you understand not only what they're learning, but how they're learning it. Okay. So the, the kind of next piece of this, when we understand uh, the reality of it. So this is the actual, the way the language is in reality. You've got not just one kind of speech, or one speed or one speaker, you've got a whole variety of all these different things. So we have the same kind of speech you would learn and down here we'll just put like the way you would learn this information. So there's not, there's not really studying here. There is some studying when you get into school, but most people already know the language and you don't need to go to school to learn how to speak. Most people just pick this up automatically. So we're not really studying the language. You could, and a lot of people do study in school, but you don't have to. You would still pick up the language. You would still understand the language and learn to speak without doing that. All right. Uh, they're also not really trying to memorize flashcards or whatever. Again, you could do that as a native, and maybe some people, if you're studying for a high school test, you might do some flashcard memorization, although it's not the best way to learn. Uh, but again, this is something you don't necessarily need for developing fluency. But what they do get, they're, so they're getting all of this input and they're learning to understand. They're learning to understand the language naturally. Okay, that's really what's happening. And at the, the very base of this, they are destroying doubt. So each time they hear another example of something, they feel a little bit better about that. So if I hear, let's say the first time a native speaker, and this is a, a native speaker learning their own language, so a young child, maybe they hear something for the first time, but they don't hear it very clearly. So they might hear, let's say, a word like, uh, I don't know, what's, I'm trying to think of an example from, from my daughter. So my daughter was watching a TV show yesterday uh, and she heard some, uh, what was that word? I think maybe, maybe an example was like uh, vibe, just as an example. So my, my daughter heard the word one time and that was maybe the first time she heard this word and she couldn't hear it very well and she said vibe? Like she was just listening on some headphones and she couldn't hear it very well. Uh, and I said, no, vibe with a V. So her, her first example is just hearing something from a video. Uh, and then I'm giving her another example a little bit more clearly. All right. And the point of this, again, is to destroy the doubt that she has about that. And so we talk about what vibe means. There, there are different ideas of this. It could be a feeling that you have or vibe like a vibration where two things are, they're kind of fluctuating like this at the same way or in the same way. So when two people feel chemistry, we call that chemistry, or they have a good vibe or this location has a good vibe, they're talking about the feeling or the atmosphere of that. So as I explain those kinds of things, I'm not, I'm not trying to give her some rules to study or anything to memorize. I'm just helping her understand naturally so she can destroy the doubt. And as she continues to hear, so now this, this word is over here in her vocabulary. It's not, maybe she won't know how to use it perfectly yet. That's okay. She's working up through the levels of understanding. Uh, but as she understands more, she will own this word and then be able to use it fluently because she's getting all these examples and she's understanding it like a native. Okay. So this is just one example. I can cover some more if people are interested. Uh, let me go through the chat before we look at the opposite and what people are often doing to learn languages. All right, so nice to see everybody here. I'll go through this pretty quickly. Uh, let's see, nice to see people on the video. Ada, good morning. Uh, Dion says, uh, hello. Looks like the Brazilian flag. Uh, Mabark, uh, let's see, good live. Alonzo says, yo. 
Hi, good time. Fanny from Honduras. Ruri, good morning. Shout out to my friend from Mexico. Jurema says hello from Sao Paulo. Nils, Annette from uh, Wisconsin. Let's see. Uh, Ariam from Saudi Arabia. Manisha, good morning. If you guys have any questions, and the uh, Hanguru, I can't read, but hello from Korea with a little heart. Nice to see you there. Uh, let's see. HM, Anor, hello, hello. Tsubasa, nice to see you there. How's the, how's the weather in Kumamoto? Or Nagasaki, rather. Well, it's actually rainy over here uh, today, but maybe, I don't know about Kumamoto. <laughs> uh, Juan says, hi there. How are you all doing? Looks like everybody's doing well. Amar, Basil, is there anyone who wants to practice speaking? Uh, at this point, I will, I will make a quick, quick word about practicing speaking because we're, we're talking about this here. Uh, speaking practice is something that natives start doing after they spend a lot of time getting this. If you think about a baby, as they grow up, they become one-year-old, two-year-old, they start speaking words, but it's after they've really started to understand. So they spend most of their time, like 99% of their time, just trying to understand the language so they can destroy doubt. And if parents or teachers are good at what they do, they can destroy that doubt faster, which gives you confidence and lets you speak. So you don't really become a good speaker by trying to just repeat after other people or speak with other people who are also maybe not good speakers, okay? So this is why I always recommend if you're feeling confident and you want to meet people to practice with, you should be meeting natives, all right? So be looking for people who are interested in the things you're interested in and not talking about, hey, let's practice English, all right? So if I want to improve my Japanese, if I'm feeling confident and I just want to speak with more people, I don't talk about learning Japanese, I just talk about whatever we're talking about. You know, we could be talking about gardening like I did when I came to Japan, uh, or I could be talking about something else. But the point is I'm not, I'm not focused on the language, I'm just using the language. And part of the reason for this is lots of natives don't know how to explain the language. So they understand the language, but they're not really good teachers of the language, like to be able to explain it to a non-native and, and often people want to get the rules and the explanations for the rules that natives, the average native just doesn't know. Okay. All right. Uh, so if you're looking for people to practice with, uh, I would not look in a YouTube chat. I would just go find other people who are interested in the same things you are and speak with them. But you can find those people on YouTube. Just watch actual uh, content for YouTube or content for English speakers here on YouTube. And there's a lot of it. All right, Amara says, uh, hello from Algeria. Hey, okay, I answered that one already. Hello from Hong Kong. Uh, and Sog's like, uh, is that China or Turkey? I can't see what that flag is. Uh, greetings from Murmansk region. Uh, Ricardo says, hello from Cork and from Brazil. And Susie, nice to see you guys all here. All right, now, so we've covered the native learner. So the native learner is really reflecting this very well. So if we have a variety of different kinds of speakers, then we should have a variety of different kinds of accents and things like that in the mind of the learner, okay? And so we're getting lots of good examples, and each of those examples, every time we get a new one, it's, it's building on our ability to understand, all right? So let's look at the non-native, so the non-native learner. So we have the native learner over here, the NL, the native learner, and this is the NNL, the non-native learner. Now, is what the non-native learner doing, does it reflect reality? Does it reflect reality? So often, uh, what people are doing in uh, like a regular class, or, or they could even be watching something here on YouTube, so typically the, the, the language they're getting is either too slow like they're watching only videos like this that are helping them understand the language, but it's really uh, quite slow for what natives actually speak. Uh, or it's too fast. So they're, they're not getting like the whole range of, of kind of speaking examples or different kinds of speech speed. Uh, they're getting stuff that's either too slow in English lessons. So if you understand everything in an English lesson, it's probably too slow and easy for you. Uh, and if it's too fast, this is usually like native movies and things like that that people like to watch, but they don't really understand or they can't follow it very well. All right. So again, this is we're 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 trying to we want to mirror this. It's it's almost like a puzzle. 
So this, this puzzle here, the reality puzzle, if I can fit, I probably can't fit that in here. Let me erase this. So you can think about, let's just see, we've got all these different pieces in here. I'm going to draw a kind of puzzle like this. And we want to have these same pieces fit over here. So if we got this piece, which is a little bit slower English, we're also hearing some slower English over here. So natives are also listening to slower English. Or we might have here some English for kids, the same thing over here. Or we have some technical English or something, and we have that same thing over here. Okay, this is the general idea of, again, the, the mind of the native inside the native, it's reflecting what the, the real world is like. Okay, so all the great variety that you have in the real world is also in the mind of the learner. But what I'm saying here is that it's actually not really in the mind. There are so many empty spaces over here. So uh, a, a learner might have like one of these or, you know, a piece over here or something like that. But they have all these extra pieces that, that aren't actually filled in. So the goal here is to fill in as much as you can. And when you understand things, excuse me, when you understand things, uh, then that's when you're able to speak fluently. All right. So it's much more difficult to become a fluent speaker if you don't have access to the variety of vocabulary, variety of speakers, variety of speeds, variety of accents, uh, and all of those different examples. All right. Now, the second part of this is, again, how people learn. So over here, we have a lot of studying, a lot of memorizing, and we have translating. Okay, I could go on. You can probably think of uh, more examples here. But the basic idea here is that the kind of language they're learning is different, and the way they're learning it is also not really reflecting reality. All right. So if you want to have the mind of a native speaker, you need to look at where the holes are in your learning. Then that's it. Now, uh, as my own personal experience, when I came to Japan, uh, this was the situation I had where I'm living in Japan, so I'm, I'm immersed in the language. I'm around people. I hear native Japanese all the time. Uh, but I was still doing this. So I could hear lots of examples, but most of the learning I was trying to do was slow, basic, very easy, but I was still trying to study and memorize and translate a lot of things, and that's why I was unable to speak, okay? So I have lots of holes in the kinds of vocabulary I'm getting, so the examples Maybe I only listen to a few teachers. I do hear maybe I have some Japanese TV on or I hear people talking at a cafe, but I can't really speak very well, so I can't uh, have a good conversation with people or have someone that, that can explain things to me. Uh, but in a Japanese class, a teacher is doing the typical thing. They're making the language slow and easy for me, uh, and they're telling me to study and memorize things and translate. But the way I'm doing this and what I'm learning, it's not reflecting reality. So, of course, when I get into a real situation, I'm struggling. I'm panicking over here. Okay? So I really want to, uh, I wanted to just make this clear for people uh, be because it can seem like there's a lot to do for language learning. And there is, there's always more to study if people are continuing to learn. Just like me, I'm still learning new words in English or learning about new things. New words are created all the time. So it never ends. But I'm able to speak fluently because I'm getting lots of examples from different people and I'm helping, uh, or uh, all of these different examples, the way I'm learning is actually helping me destroy any doubt I have about using the vocabulary, all right? So this way of learning and these holes in what you're learning, it creates lots of doubt. And that's what's, re that's what's really stopping most people from speaking. So it's not where you live or how much speaking practice or how much you know. It's just in a conversation, if you think about that moment when it's time to speak, do you feel too nervous about making mistakes? Are you shy or whatever? That means that doubt is actually the thing that's stopping you from speaking. Because I've met great speakers who are living in the United States and great speakers who are not living in the United States or have never been to an English-speaking country. But because of how they learn, they're reflecting. So it's like a mirror here, all right? So as a learner, you need to think about what you're missing and then get more of that, all right? So it's pretty easy. It's almost like a map. I'm not drawing this very, very clearly, but you should get the idea of 
if I'm only listening to slow speakers, well, so in this example over here, if I only watch YouTube like English lesson videos that are slow and I'm not getting uh, other examples of things that are faster at a regular native speed, then it's going to be more difficult for me when I, when I move from learning environment to the real world. So you can study by yourself and understand something. I can be playing a little app uh, and, and understand that. But if I'm not also getting all these other examples over here, it's going to be much more difficult when I try to communicate. So this is why lots of people struggle. All right. Uh, it's a pretty simple idea, but uh, I thought about making this video because people ask me about particular things they struggle with, like their accent or whatever. But in a basic idea, just think about the imagine the, the reality of real communication. And you can think about that for your native language. So when you're hearing people, you hear lots of different speakers, lots of different speeds, different accents all day uh, in your native language. So if you can reflect that, but also to try to learn the same way a native learns, all right? That's how you develop the mind of a native speaker. So you're not trying to study or memorize the language. You really want to understand it and destroy any doubt you have about using vocabulary or grammar, pronunciation, or whatever, okay? All right, so it's a pretty simple idea, uh, but I thought maybe visually this would be a little bit easier for people, a good reminder. Let me go back and look at chat. If you have specific questions about this or anything else, uh, then I can answer those for you. Uh, Vinicius says, hello from Brazil. Uh, let's see, Elder, hi, Drew. I learned some English with you. Thanks a bunch. It's my pleasure. Uh, Basil, do you suggest any apps to practice speaking? I studied English language and literature in an Arab country. We didn't get exposed to speaking that much. Uh, I know how to speak, but I lack fluency. Yeah, uh, so again, th like th that question is perfect for this situation. So if you think about how you learned in school, so I don't know the specifics about that, but I can guess you probably used some Arabic to learn English, maybe. Uh, so you probably had some translations, probably had memorizing, probably studying, and you probably weren't exposed to lots of native examples and in a variety of native examples. This variety of speech is really important because, uh, again, if I hear one word in a class, I might not hear that word in a real situation. But natives, uh, they get lots of different examples of how people speak or different ways of saying things. So what I call naturally varied review, they're getting this automatically. So my father says something, my mother says uh, the same thing, or she says something similar. So as an example, let's say uh, I'm sitting at the table, the dinner table with my family. Uh, so let's just say here's a table. We're gonna look at it from the top down. Uh, we have four people over here. Uh, so let's just say these are my kids. So this is Ari over here. This is Noel. Uh, and this is my wife. And this is me. Uh, and let's say Noel. So Noel is five years old and she's jumping around in the chair. She wants to run around. Uh, there are different ways we could tell her to sit down. So as an example, uh, I could say sit down. I could also say have a seat. All right, or I could say put your butt down. If I'm feeling a bit, you know, maybe funnier or I'm just like, we're, we're not so serious yet. Sit down, have a seat, put your butt down. There are different ways I can express this same situation. And then my wife could say something similar, okay? So have a seat, sit down. She could say the same thing, but with a different accent or a slightly different pronunciation, all right? So in an English class, you might hear something like sit down, for example. But over here, the native would hear something like sit down. So usually a parent is communicating very clearly sit down if you're maybe in an angrier mood and you really want your child to listen sit down. So I'm expressing everything very clearly so it's easy to understand. My child understands the words. They can hear all the sounds clearly. But sometimes I'm just speaking faster and I blend the sounds of my words together so it sounds more like sit down. So the T disappears. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. It depends on the situation. So the same speaker could actually say the same sentence or the same phrase in a different way. 
And all of this variety is naturally helping you understand, just like it's helping you understand right now. So you think, oh, that's interesting. You could hear sit down or sit down, sit down, sit down. All right. So hopefully this makes sense. So if you're learning a lot, that doesn't necessarily make you a fluent speaker because what you learn and how you learn it is important. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully this is clear. So we want to reflect reality, the way you're learning, what you're learning, uh, the more it reflects reality, the more you will speak fluently. So if you are getting examples of all these different kinds of speakers, different speeds, different accents, different vocabulary, and you're able to understand these things without using a lot of translations, uh, it's, and it's easy to understand things. Like if you tell a child, sit down, you're actually showing them, okay, we're going to put you in a chair and sit you down. Or I could do the opposite, like stand up. Okay? And children understand this directly in English. They're not, they're not using uh, Portuguese or Chinese or Vietnamese or something to learn that language. They're learning English in English. All right? So if you have these things over here, that's what would cause you to know a lot of English, but actually struggle with fluency. So this is a big problem for people because often they're not learning enough of the, enough of the variety. Again, they're just getting a few pieces of this but not really a lot, uh, much, much less than you need to have a good conversation with people and to understand lots of different kinds of speakers. And then the way they're learning it is going to make it more difficult. So all these kinds of things are usually creating more doubt, more questions. So if I learn, like when I came to Japan and I was talking with uh, teachers trying to understand the language that they would just give me explanations. They were like, well, this is the, uh, the present progressive and uh, you need to memorize it like this and this is the structure of it. And I'm just, I'm, okay, I think maybe I'm too stupid to learn this way. But when I remember, wait, I didn't learn English that way, but I can speak English just fine. <laughs> so maybe I should learn English or maybe I should learn Japanese the way I'm learning English. All right. So I want to have I want to reflect reality and I want to actually understand it the way that would help me use it, help me develop fluency. All right, so good question. Uh, I know a lot of people struggle with that same thing, but this is the reason why. So you have, uh, again, uh, the, the kind of language that you're learning is different or it's only a small part of the whole. And typically the way you're learning is making it more difficult for you to communicate because it's creating more doubt. Uh, let's see here. Uh, and let's see, Sam Rushka says, I am an English language teaching student in Turkey. Uh, I try to in, immerse myself in English with listening to native speakers. Yeah, so you want to get more examples of native speakers, but you actually want to understand what they're saying. So if you're just getting lots of examples of natives, but you don't really understand what's happening and you don't understand it well enough to use it fluently, then it's, it's good, but it's not as good as your learning should be. So the point, uh, the goal is really to destroy doubt, to eliminate any doubt for each thing that you're using. So if you have a grammar point that you're shy about learning, what that means is you have some kind of doubt about that. So you're nervous about saying the wrong thing, so you should go back and focus on that particular grammar point, and that will actually help improve your conversations greatly. Okay? So it will help you get more examples, uh, and typically that's how people are learning. Uh, and natives would actually learn much faster if they, if they use like the particular kinds of uh, principles I teach here when people understand we're, we're really trying to destroy doubt. But often kids are hearing things and they don't really understand what they're listening to. So parents, if they take care, or teachers, uh, and help, <coughs> excuse me, and help uh, kids understand things better or more clearly, then they become fluent faster. They become more confident about what they know and they can start speaking faster. All right. Uh, the last point I'll make very quickly about this is that Speaking practice is not listed up here because that's not how you develop like the, the confidence and destroy the doubt. So if I learn a word, like we had vibe up here before, I don't become more fluent in that word by repeating it. So me speaking, me saying the word vibe, or if I just told you a random word in Japanese and asked you to repeat after me, then you're not going to start using that word more fluently because 
you still have some kind of doubt about it. Like, okay, I heard some word, but it's it's just a sound, and maybe I kind of understand it, but not not really. Okay. All right. So. Uh, yes, obviously natives are speaking, but typically natives have the same issues that non-natives do, where if they don't feel confident, they won't say something. They will pick a different word or uh, use a different way of expressing something that they do feel confident about, because no one likes making mistakes in front of other people. All right, that's just, that's universal. Everybody has that issue. All right, uh, let's see. Basil says the name of the app is Frederick. Uh, yes, if you're talking about our pronunciation app, uh, you can click on the link in the description below this video to get that. All right, uh, professional facts. Hi, sir, from India. Andres says, Adrian, can you explain how a native would learn the differences between close and near? Close and near. Well, typically when natives are learning vocabulary, so that's, that's a good example. Um, let me clear some space here. I think people are getting it. <clears throat> So remember the first time, if we, if, if we could look at it like a, a series of, of, of short, very quick lessons that natives get. Uh, let's say I have a, a situation where, let's see. Uh, so I have uh, my marker over here, and I have uh, the eraser. Uh, so I can put the eraser and the marker uh, close to each other or near, and I could say, like, look, the marker... So the marker is near the eraser. So that's maybe the first time you hear the word, oh, the marker is near. That's kind of the target word I'm teaching. So look, the marker is near the eraser. Now, if I keep this exact same situation, and then I say, oh, the marker is close to the eraser, then you learn for this situation, you could use either of these, all right? And this is just two examples. So the first example is the marker is near. Second example, the marker is close to something else, all right? But what happens over time is that natives will get, look, so we have a word like, if we just look at this, if I give uh, this word on a piece of paper to a native and I say, please read this, some people would say close, and some people might say close because they're thinking about different situations. So as a child is learning these things, they might see the word near and they understand that. They're like, okay, like something is close to something else. Uh, but they also learn the vocabulary. Maybe they're learning the spelling of that. But then they, they learn that the same word might actually have a different meaning in different situations. So for this Situation right here, we have two things that are close or near each other, but I might have close, like close the door. All right? And again, as they're getting all of these, they're, they're, they're filling in this little map where they hear, oh, that's interesting. Like the word close, it could be spelled uh, like this, or we could also have the word close with the same spelling. Okay? And so if you're, if you're trying to teach someone we want to make it like a, like a science experiment, to let people understand something without needing to translate or to explain very much. So if I say, oh, look, the marker is close, and then my wife or someone else comes over and says, yeah, the marker is like near, then people would think, oh, okay, in this situation, you know, uh, typically a, a non-native might think, okay, well, I guess near and close always mean the same thing, and then they, they kind of stop, stop learning. All right, they're like, okay, I got that. Now I move on to the next thing. But the native is actually continuing, excuse me again, the native is uh, actually continuing to get more examples of things over time. Okay? And it's the variety of something that really helps people understand. But again, here, the marker is near the eraser and the marker is close to the eraser. So I really want to make it clear that for this situation, we have the same. Uh, the same thing, the same situation, but we can express it with different vocabulary. Okay? So that's how you would learn it. Uh, and then as you get uh, different examples, uh, like we might hear uh, like another situation where like I'm close, close to my goal, close to my goal, or I'm near my goal. And so here it's not a, a physical example, but it's a, a, a figurative similar idea. 
So I'm working hard to do something and I almost achieved that thing. So I'm very near my goal. Uh, I think someone just said nearby. That's the same, same kind of thing. So you could also use nearby uh, in the same way. Nearby. So one thing is near something else or close to or nearby. So when you're learning things like a native, this is reflecting reality. So in reality, people will express the same situation in different ways. All right. So it's not just one way. We don't only use the word near for something. We also use close or we use uh, like around or next to, depending on how close it is or very close. We might even uh, like alter it a little bit. Extremely close. Like they're, they're, right, they're right next to each other. Okay? So it's not like a specific thing. Nearby means, you know, five feet or something like that. So people will, people will just use a general idea like around this marker. This is, you know, close or we're getting further away. We're moving away from the marker. All right? Hopefully everybody gets it though. Does everybody, does this make sense? So when we're trying, especially if we're trying to teach kids or when I'm trying to teach anybody, uh, I want to make the examples simple and I want to change only one thing. So I'm going to keep everything else. The marker is near the eraser or the marker is nearby. The marker is close to, so you understand, oh, these are different ways of saying the same thing for this situation. And that's how the native mind is working. So they're thinking, oh, there, there are all these different situations and we have all these different ways of expressing things. And that's how people learn to speak fluently. So if they don't feel confident about one, if they don't like, maybe there's one way or one word, they, don't, they forget the word near for some reason, they remember close or nearby or some, something else, all right? So you might even have a higher level word like in proximity to. All right, prox. So proximity means like around the area. It's the same thing. It's just a more advanced or maybe more detailed or uh, educated sounding word, but it's the same thing. Okay. So as you're getting these different examples, that's what helps you understand these things like a native. All right. Hopefully that answers that question. But let me know. Uh, again, my, my job here is to eliminate any doubt people have. So if there are still things uh, that you want to, uh, you know, if you still have questions, it's why I'm here. I want to make sure I answer everything for people. All right. Uh, let's see. Lewis says, hey, teacher, uh, you asked me to record a video speaking English, but I'm in the second month on Fluent for Life when I spend a year long going to record. I'm excited how much I'm going to learn. <laughs> well, you don't have to wait a whole year because you will be speaking much better before that. But whenever you feel comfortable, feel free to make a video. All right. So it says uh, thinking face over there. Uh, Hamidullah says, hi, sir, I have a question. Words are disappearing while I speak uh, English. What should I do to speak fluently? Uh, again, you need to spend more time and make sure you eliminate the doubt that you have about vocabulary. And that's typically why uh, like people forget words when they don't know those words very well. Okay. So the same thing for me right now, I'm, I'm trying to learn Japanese kanji. So these are the Japanese written characters. And if I feel confident about the character, I can write it very easily. But if I don't feel confident, I forget, I forget what the character is. Like, ah, I need to think of a better way to remember that. Okay. So it means I like, it's how well do you know that information? So again, most people over here, when they're trying to learn a language as a non-native speaker, they're doing lots of things that make it more difficult for them to understand. Like they're getting uh, examples that are only too slow or they're not actually seeing how natives would actually speak or they're trying to memorize things and it's just not how the mind likes to learn. The mind likes to discover things and understand examples like this one. So if I say the mind or the, excuse me, the marker, uh, is near something, or the marker is close by, or the marker is in proximity to. All those examples, you might not remember them immediately, but from the first time you hear that, you think, oh, okay, like my brain is starting to get it without me giving you a long explanation or a translation. So if I can help you understand it like a native understands it, then you will feel more confident and you will speak more fluently. So this is how you stop forgetting words when you speak. You actually have to reflect reality in when in the way you learn and what you learn. Okay. 
All right, now we're getting more comments over here. Let's see here. All right, uh, Vanessa says, do we lose the ability to communicate over time? It's maybe a psychological issue. Sometimes I feel I've lost my skills or as if they've gotten worse. Uh, well, I mean, I, like I will forget some English sometimes if I don't use it. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I use Japanese in daily life here, and sometimes I will, I'm like, what is that word? I forget what that word is in English. I, it's like I know some words in Japanese, or, or even some words I learn uh, in Japanese and don't know what they are in English, like the names of a, a, a flower or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, typically, if you, if, you don't, if you don't kind of review it or get more examples or things like that, it, you could lose it over time, so anything you're not really using uh, but typically, you can get it back very quickly. It's like learning to ride a bike. The next time you ride, you might at first feel a little bit nervous, but you quickly learn to do it again. So you, you won't lose it forever. Anderson says, I like to watch your video. You is a good teacher. Congrats. Thank you. You would say you are a good teacher, but thank you. Uh, Ali says, I was more confident in speaking English a couple months ago. I was speaking in a great way with U.S. accent, but I stopped to practice. And I'm feeling like I'm losing my skills. What should I do? Well, how were you learning before? Keep, keep doing that. Go back to what you were doing. <laughs> Whatever you were doing, don't stop. All right. This is just advice for, uh, for the way I got fluent and what has been successful for my students is just helping people eliminate the doubt that stops them from speaking. Uh, and so if you're feeling worse over time or something, or I mean, you don't really have to spend a lot of time speaking, but you should be getting lots of examples of other people speaking. All right. So lots of variety like we're talking about here. All right. Remember, you don't need to speak in order to improve your speaking ability. I know this sounds weird, but the, uh, the idea is that the more examples we get that we really understand and they eliminate the doubt we have, then when we do speak, we will feel confident and the vocabulary will speak, uh, will speak it clearly and correctly without thinking about it. So that's the goal. All right, Advanced Civilization. Hi, sir. How are you doing? I think I'm late. Uh, it's okay. You can watch these videos anytime. Nelly there, what are the best ways to memorize new words? Uh, I've, if you look on my channel for that, I have a video, a couple of videos where I talk about word memorization specifically. Um, so just watch those. I think one of them is uh, how to remember or how to learn like 10,000 words, something like that. Uh, so watch that video. But the, the, it's, it's, it's part of this. Like it's connected to this. Also, we have a whole memory program. Uh, like people who have the native fluency blueprint, uh, some, some people get that. Uh, it's also included in Fluent for Life. <clears throat> Learning English says, hey, Drew, I usually learn English by using a dictionary because it offers lots of example sentences, which using vocabularies that I want to learn, I put 30 minutes to read sentences of each vocabulary. Uh, I don't recommend people do this. If you want to, it's okay. But remember, when you learn with a dictionary, it's not really reflecting the way people speak. So it's very easy to look at a book and you can see clearly what the examples are and how things are spelled. But in the real world, it's not that clean and clear. Okay, so you need to get both. So if you're only looking at a dictionary and you're not also getting these other examples. Again, we want to fill in this whole puzzle over here. We only uh, get a few pieces and we're still going to struggle. So people who could study the dictionary, uh, they still might not feel very confident about uh, like how they feel or they might not remember the words very well or they might not hear them when other people are using them because they're pronounced differently. All right. So if, if that's helping you, and, and when people ask me for advice about things like this, like, am I doing this, this correctly? Uh, the, the main thing is, are you eliminating the doubt you have that stops you from speaking? So if you have any doubt, then you should probably do something different. But if you are eliminating the doubt, if you feel more confident and you feel more fluent, then keep doing what you're doing. All right. So if reading the dictionary is actually helping you have better conversations, then great, continue doing that. But it's probably not going to help most people because, again, the reality doesn't reflect what's in the dictionary. All right. It's a part of it. So you will get, you know, slow, easy, clear examples in, in real speech sometimes, but a lot of it is not. All right. So you have to reflect that in the way you learn. So if you only get some pieces, it's going to be more difficult for you. 
Uh, Sam Rushka, again, I don't, do not worry about it. I also try to understand the teacher. Yes, and it's really my job as the teacher to be understandable. So it's not really your job to like work hard to understand what I'm saying. I want to make my language and uh, my explanations easy for people to understand. Mark Winter said it is more difficult to learn the first native language than any other. Afterwards, a five-year-old child has been exposed to their native language for X number of hours, et cetera, et cetera. An adult uh, with only 250 is fully bilingual. Um, I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily more difficult or easier uh, because if, if I could take a baby in their native language and then I could take an adult and they both like a child is born on one day and I start learning with an adult if I could teach that I would I would be a baby for sure <laughs> like if, if you could give me like two years or something I wouldn't even need that much time but uh, the advantages that a child has versus the advantages an adult has it's just it's, it's really difficult to compare that because there are many things that an adult can do that a child cannot. And the most important one of those is choose how they learn. So some people have parents that, you know, they say things and the child just doesn't understand what the parent is talking about. And so uh, it's more difficult. You can say lots of English. And this is why, like, the, the idea of just, uh, like, input by itself, yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it's like if I if I if I have a like a fire hose and I just shoot a lot of water at you, you will maybe like drink some of those drops, but most of it will just go over your face or whatever. You won't actually remember anything or learn anything or understand anything very well. All right. So when people think like they have these ideas about how a native child would learn and it's faster or easier, but that that's not necessarily true. Uh, and you can actually start. Uh, learning, you want you basically want to take the the best of of both things. So if I like the 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 obviously the fastest way is if you are a native and you learn the way I'm explaining, which is eliminating doubt. All right. So this is what I do with my own kids. So I don't have as much time with them for teaching them English. Uh, most of their day is spent in Japanese. And so I have to be clever about how I teach them because they have less time to learn but they're still learning in a native way, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. So I know it seems like the child has, a, has an obvious advantage, but their obvious advantage is also that adults forget that they have. All right, um, where do we go here? All right, uh, again, it says, did you also attend a school in Japan to learn the language or did you learn the language through conversations with NL? or through your wife. Well, I, I didn't get married right when I came to Japan. Uh, so I was, I, was, I was by myself trying to learn, and most of what I did was uh, this, the traditional, typical ways of learning the language. So I would try to study a bunch of words, but I very quickly saw that, wait a minute, what I'm hearing or seeing in, like, in the textbook example, so I'm listening to these CDs. You guys remember CDs? <laughs> So I'm listening to these examples, but the, the real way people speak, and especially I'm in a small town in Nagasaki, and it's a little bit, it's not like in the country, but uh, people speak differently. This is not the same way that you would have like a, like a professional newscaster in Tokyo. It's a different way of speaking. So people pronounce things differently, different vocabulary. Again, this over here. So if I'm only listening to one kind of speech, then it's going to be much more difficult in real life if the people around me don't speak that way. So I need to get those examples uh, and really help people understand things, uh, and that's what I was doing for myself. So once I understood that I need to reflect what's happening in the real world, the kind of language that real people are using, and I need to understand it like a native, that's when I changed and I started understanding things more just like understanding from situations. And so gardening, when I came to Japan and started uh, studying gardening, that was a really good thing for me to do because I'm, I'm doing something physical. I can see we can talk about different kinds of plants or moving rocks or something like that. And I'm able to understand directly in Japanese without having an explanation because of my, my like all of the guys who I worked with, they didn't speak any English. So I had to understand it, you know, but I, I did take like some Japanese classes, but I quit those pretty quickly because they didn't help. Uh, greetings from Mexico says Alejandro over there. Elu, Elu says, what up? Justice says, I used to listen to your podcast and advanced listening videos and still love two pieces of art. Glad to hear it. If you know other people who would enjoy them, please uh, 
recommend. Let's see, Mark, again, uh, just don't stop practicing and keep tracking of your time. So you would say keeping track of your time, of exposure to your target language. Don't stop practicing because you forget uh, if there is no continuity. Uh, again, when, when people talk about practicing, it's the, the steady improvement or the steady uh, destruction of doubt. That's really what practice means. So when people think about like, how do you practice a language? It's just, how do I get more examples or how do I fill this up? And how do I actually understand things so that I feel confident about speaking? Eunice, again, I see you there. Uh, how many languages do you speak right now? I speak Japanese and English, and I know a little bit of French and Spanish. I could understand some, <clears throat> but not much. I don't have the confidence to speak. I know I would speak incorrectly. I remember uh, a few years ago, I was in Colombia, uh, in Bogota, and I was in a taxi, and I just couldn't, I like, I was, I was really frustrated because I couldn't, I couldn't say anything. The taxi driver is, He's kind of trying to talk to me. I was just getting a taxi to the airport, and I was just like, ah, because I like talking with people. You know, most of the people I help, they, they enjoy speaking or they need to speak for their job, and when you can't communicate, it's really frustrating. So, again, the problem is I, I had lots of doubt about vocabulary. Like, I don't know that word, or I don't know how to say that correctly, uh, and that stopped me from speaking. Uh, could you please explain how to use who's and who? Uh, this is not really the video for that, but I have covered that before. Um, but the basic idea is uh, you have to think about, are you talking about an object or, well, I don't even want to like go into it. <laughs> uh, explaining what it is because I have covered it before. But if you search my YouTube channel, you will find more about that. Uh, What's up says, very cool premise for a live stream video topic. All right. Whose phone is this and to whom am I speaking? Yes. Okay. Those are some good examples. Thumbs up right off the bat, says Alejandro, and I see there, Juan again, kind, the easy to understand, but very easy to forget. Uh, any advice for that situation? Kind of, what do you mean? I would just get more examples. So you, you, you know, you really know what you, what you struggle with. So if you have trouble understanding people, then you should get more examples of that kind of speech. Or if you struggle with using correct grammar, you should get more examples of that kind of grammar. All right, but you, you should be trying to understand it like a native, and that's the like the examples I give in these videos. That's what we're doing. Mahmoud says my native language is Arabic, and I want to learn English. Please give me advice to achieve that. Well, you're getting advice right now. <clears throat> What's up says are you going to be posting this as a video that can be viewed? Yes. So all these videos we save, uh, and they are just freely available after people watch uh, after people watch the live. Advances, what am what I am doing now is copying every single word that come from your mouth, Mr. Drew. <laughs> I'm doing it accurately. What do you think about that? Well, copying, copying me is a good idea, but only if you understand what I'm saying. So you might hear things and like again, you you kind of improve in these layers over time. And I might say something now and you don't quite understand it, and that's okay. Maybe you hear it again later from some other place or I use it again in some other video, and then it clicks in your mind where you think, ah, now I got it, all right? So it's a process of adding these layers because typically you don't hear something for the first time and understand it and remember it perfectly, okay? It just doesn't work like that. You've got to build it up. Uh, over time. But as you're continuing to do these things, it's much faster if you do it like a native rather than like a traditional student. <clears throat> uh, let's see, Susie again with another interesting face. Ilya says, I have watched your videos for several years. You are really a helpful teacher. Glad to hear it. Uh, if you know other people I can help, send them my way. C is back. A student hit his classmate. Then the teacher asked him why he hit him. So the student replied, I did nothing. He literally just hit me out of the blue. Any question? Uh, my question is, uh, what is the expression? Oh, is the expression out of the blue? <clears throat> so this is a perfect example of when we're trying to understand something like a native. So if we imagine this, um, There are two ways we can try to learn this. There is the traditional way of understanding it like a student, or we can understand it like a native. So if I have two people here, so this guy is, he's just kind of standing here. Uh, maybe he's looking, looking at something over here. And then there's another student over here. Uh, he's holding a bat, 
let's just say, make this more interesting. Uh, so this student is standing here, uh, and this student just says, uh, dum to dum and uh, we're just gonna, like, I'm just gonna hit this other kid over the head, or hit him in the head with a bat. And the teacher, uh, maybe they hear something, and, uh, and the teacher says, why? Why did you do that? And so they're thinking, usually you have to, you have to like provoke that person, you have to do something, maybe you make them angry or something like that. But in this situation, there was no logical reason. This one kid just hit the other kid in the head with the bat. And so we hear the expression out of the blue. So we begin with the situation, one kid hits another kid with a bat out of the blue. So what do you think that might mean? Again, I'm trying to help you understand it like a native. We begin with the situation and then from the context of that, oh, he did it out of the blue. So another way he might say something instead of using this, uh, maybe they say like, uh, no reason. So no reason or I don't know. Uh, and so it, there, there could be many different ways to express this, but when we hear out of the blue, this is one expression uh, for this situation and maybe we hear it uh, in another situation. So as an example, uh, let's say I was uh, talking with a friend of mine, so this is not this situation, we're moving to a slightly different situation. I'm talking with a friend of mine uh, and out of the blue, uh, like a fly just you know flies into my mouth and I swallow that fly, okay? And so you get the, the understanding of like, oh, that's interesting, yes. Like, so Elizabeth just put it in there, like unexpected or sudden. But my goal as a teacher is not to just give you a definition or a translation. I really want to help you understand it so you get that like, ah, okay, I understand what that means, okay? If you do that, you start really understanding like a native, so you're learning the native vocabulary, but you're also understanding it like a native. Okay, so when something comes out of the blue, if I'm just trying to give a uh, like explanation of it, it's like just some random thing happens, it's surprising, it's unexpected, and we can think about out of the blue, like you imagine the blue sky up here and just like, wow, here's like an alien spaceship or something. It just comes, wow, out of the blue. Okay, so you can think about it as out of the blue sky, or you can think about like some like dragon or monster comes out of the blue ocean or something like that, okay? But that's how you want to learn and understand this. So typically people want to just go straight to a definition. So the, 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 the less effective way of teaching is just to give an example of something, okay? So I want to help you understand the context so you feel, ah, okay, I'm connecting the context with the situation and that vocabulary. So these two things are connected. So if we understand the whole story, this student did something to this student for no reason. So he's just saying, like, for no reason. I don't know. Out of the blue, he just hit me. It was just some surprising, weird, unexpected thing. All right. Uh, how are we doing here? Coming up on an hour so far. Let me have a drink. My quick break. Look at that. I'm back to my mint tea. Ah, freshly brewed mint tea. Very lovely. All right. Uh, I think I answered that one already. Let's see. The Dark Knight. I hate speaking in English. Well, uh, you haven't explained much more than just I hate doing it, but typically people hate speaking because they don't really understand what they're saying. Uh, and it's, it's not your fault if you dislike English or having to speak English. Most people are teaching in a way that's making it more difficult for you to speak. That's the real problem, okay? So if, you, if you're learning the language, even if you're trying to study very hard uh, and, you, uh, and you're, like, you feel like a good student, it can still be very frustrating if you don't actually understand what you're learning, okay? So our brains are not designed to just remember a bunch of, uh, you know, examples or, or like a list of things. That's just not how we learn. Uh, all right, let me, let's see. It's sound, unmake sense. All right, I don't know if you, 
All right, let me let me know let me know if if if, if anything about this is not clear. All right, uh, learning issues. Thank you, Drew. What's up? Says the website. Close Master might offer a way to use a similar or the same approach to this concept of filling in the blank uh, with any number of different potential words. Yes. Um, so there are lots of examples of an app or a thesaurus or something that can explain different ways of saying things. But will you remember it? All right. It's easy to get examples in a dictionary or from a thesaurus, but will you remember them? So you notice here, I'm taking more time with it. I could just give an explanation or a definition of the word, but if I do this, you feel a, a stronger emotional connection. It becomes more memorable for you. You really understand what's happening. And ah, now you feel confident about using this. All right, so that's the goal. It's not, and this is why people want to go get a list of words and try to remember them, but they don't actually speak fluently. They don't feel confident about what they know. They don't know the vocabulary very well because it's not reflecting reality. They get lots of examples in a dictionary, but that's just not how people speak. People don't speak like you see words in a dictionary. It's just, it's, it's like two different languages. Okay. So again, you need to make sure what you're doing is reflecting reality. <clears throat> All right, where did I where did I miss over here? I think here. All right, so this is whom? Okay, I think uh, you guys are answering each other. Uh, it's that okay if I read a book? So you would say, is that okay if I read a book with an audio book in English, or should I start talking about myself in English? Should I pray to God in English, or what should I do to speak more fluently? You don't have to like. I want. I really want to make this clear. You don't have to speak to become more fluent. I know it, and it's, it's, it, this really sounds like, it sounds like I'm being stupid. Uh, if I say you don't have to speak to become more fluent. But if we really think about where does, where does fluency comes, where does fluency come from? Fluency comes from really understanding something well. All right. It's not about speaking. You understand something well. All right. So if I, if someone tells me right now, I need to give a speech about, uh, I don't know, like fixing computers or something. I could not do that. Even though I'm fluent in English, I'm not fluent about that. I can't speak about how to fix computers. I, I know very little about the inside of computers. I know some, but not much. Not enough to give a, a speech about how to fix computers. Now, if I study it for a little bit, if I see lots of examples of other people doing that, I could very quickly learn to do that. So I give an example of this uh, about learning to make espresso. So if you go to my YouTube channel and, and type, uh, or actually just look at, it's one of the, uh, it should be a video near the top called uh, like uh, making espresso or how to make espresso in English. And it's about naturally varied review. So I give you four different examples of different people making the same thing. So the focus is, how do we make espresso? And I've got four different people talking about that. And then we can see those examples of, of oh, wow, look at that. And now I know more vocabulary and I could explain more about how to make espresso. I'm not an expert in it, but I could understand that. So that's how I become fluent in making espresso. And you can think about becoming fluent in a language like becoming fluent in anything else. But the, 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 the difference between uh, like language learning, again, um, and, and like a typical skill like learning to play the piano or something is because the environment, the real environment is dynamic and it's so, it's so varied. If I'm trying to learn to play the piano, I can practice that over and over again. And so people think about practicing speech in the same way, but it's not the same thing. What we actually need to do is be prepared for reality. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm learning an instrument like, or trying to play a sport or something like that, it's easy for me to practice that thing by myself, by doing that thing. But you become uh, fluent in English, the actual practice of that comes from understanding the language better. You eliminate the doubt, and when you have no doubt, that's where you naturally have confidence and you start speaking. So you don't have to take time like trying to do all these things in English. It's more, okay, if you like to pray or you like to cook or whatever your interest is, get more of that in English. Get more examples. You don't need to sit and talk about anything. You just need to hear lots of examples until you feel confident that you understand something well.
and then you can start speaking. All right. So you could, you really, I mean, you, you can force yourself to start speaking before you feel confident or comfortable, but that's often demotivating for many people. People don't like making mistakes in front of others. You know, that's an obvious common thing. And so the easier thing is just to get lots of examples to eliminate the doubt about whatever you're, you're learning or whatever you're interested in. So that's how you do it. So don't think about spending time trying to do something. Like when I'm looking at uh, people's comments, I can see basic errors in what they're writing. And that means they don't know that vocabulary or that grammar very well. So you should spend more time trying to understand that. You already know a lot of words, but you don't know them very well. You don't have complete confidence. All right. We want you to really feel strongly uh, that you can use something well without making a mistake. Okay. It's like if I get into a fight with somebody, if I don't feel like, uh, okay, I don't know anything about fighting, I'm going to be, I'm, you know, I'm probably going to lose this fight, I will not have much confidence. But if I'm a well-trained fighter, if I really understand how to fight, I will feel more confident uh, and more sure that I will win. All right? So I want you to feel like that in the conversation. So you spend more time just trying to understand the language. And this should be uh, exciting for people because you don't have to find anyone to practice speaking with. You just get lots of examples, but you, you really should get those examples in a way that helps you understand the language. All right? That's how you get fluent. All right. Um, uh, but about like, you, you can also listen to an audiobook while you read it. That's, that's a good thing to do. Again, that's giving you different examples of, of the vocabulary. That's more naturally varied review. Alandra says, I don't think that is necessary. Maybe just watching again and again, Drew's videos will do the magic. Yes. Uh, again, like my, my videos are part of this. So in, in our program, Fluent for Life, we're trying to give you the whole picture. I don't, if I only make videos of me talking uh, for trying to develop fluency, it's less helpful than getting lots of examples of other natives and lots of other people doing things in different ways, at different speeds, in different times. Uh, all of that is what's going to get you fluent, okay? So only watching me uh, in these YouTube videos, it's helpful, but it's not as helpful as, as hearing lots of examples. Uh, just to give you a, a quick non-language uh, learning example of this, I, I heard a story years ago about a zoo, uh, and at this zoo there were uh, there was like a, a chimpanzee, you know, like an ape cage or an enclosure. So you had a zoo, and th they had a like with a bunch of. Uh, I'm going to draw. <laughs> As usual, I'm trying to draw quickly. How do I draw? Let's see. Let's imagine as a as a chimpanzee, kind of. All right, so we have, let, let's say there's like 10 of them in this, in this enclosure, all right? Now, the, this older, uh, kind of, he was kind of like the number one male, like the most, you know, everyone respected him. He was kind of the leader, <clears throat> but he had a limp, a limp. So he walked and there was something wrong with his leg and he, he kind of walked like that. And what was interesting is that all the other monkeys, the younger monkeys, they started to copy him. And they started walking with a limp too because they just thought that was the cool thing to do because he was doing it, but he was just doing that because he had a problem with his leg. Now the reason I bring this up uh, is because, again, if you only get one example of something, then you are going to copy that example and that's how you will speak. So imagine if I have a teacher, I live in a very small town and only one person speaks to me like my mother speaks to me. I'm going to sound exactly like my mother. I'm going to speak like she does. I'm going to have, if she mispronounces a word, I'm going to mispronounce it in the same way. And this is why we need to get all these different examples that really, it's a, it's a well-rounded, we call this well-rounded, it really covers a lot, way of learning so that you really understand. That's the whole point. So if I get into a conversation, like you can imagine one of these younger chimpanzees, he goes and maybe he goes to a different zoo or he goes, I don't know, back to the jungle or something and he sees people or not, well, he sees chimpanzees uh, and they're walking normally. Uh, and, then, and then he says like, oh, well, he thinks to himself, wait a minute, like he, this, this guy doesn't have a limp, you know? Uh, and so, this is a, it's just an example of how people, people will, will imprint. I, I did a whole video about this, about imprinting too. So like a baby chick will imprint on, 
whatever the, the mother is, usually it's the mother hen, but it could be a person or another animal or something like that. Uh, so you want to get not just one teacher or one example, you need to get lots of them. So it is helpful to watch these videos, uh, but I really want you to get a nice variety of people, okay? Good variety. So this is why uh, we organize Fluent for Life the way it is. So we give you lots of examples of different speakers. All right, how are we doing for time here? All right. <clears throat> Uh, I'm still on the out of the blue comments. <laughs> uh, let's see. Can you understand British English? Yes, I can. There are some words that I don't know, uh, and maybe the pronunciation is slightly different, but in general, I lived in England for a couple of months. I lived in London, and I, I could understand people just fine. So they, they speak a little bit differently, but in general, the language is similar. All right, uh, let's see. I'll the fly example was hilarious, Drew. Can you imagine swallowing a, that darn bug? Yes, I've actually done that before. So I've actually, you know, like, uh, swallow, swallow a fly. <laughs> there's, a, there's actually an interesting, uh, a kid's song called I Know an Old Lady Who Swallowed a Fly. You can look it up on YouTube if you want to listen to it. Uh, but this is for kids. And I've sung this for my for my own daughters or when I was a teacher of little kids back in school. So I know an old lady who swallowed a fly. Uh, and I'm not going to sing it for you here, but the, the story is that she then she swallows a bird to try to catch the, the fly and the spider and these other things that, that are inside her until she dies. <laughs> uh, it's, it's funny. There's actually a lot of kids songs that it's like people dying or whatever. I don't know why that is, but... <laughs> But anyway, um, all right, uh, so Moo says, Hi, I study English with English dubbed and subtitled Japanese anime and manga and wonder if the expressions are used in accurate English. Do these sources seem natural for native English speakers? Uh, it depends. I mean, you, you want to get like good examples of stuff uh, if you can, so natural examples of things. And if you are learning with a translation, there might, like the English might be correct, but it might be different from what the Japanese is, okay? So someone will translate that and the English by itself would be correct, but maybe they don't actually say that in Japanese. So sometimes that happens in, uh, in any kind of translation. And again, that's why we want to understand things like a native rather than trying to use dubbed examples. So I would actually recommend uh, like shorter or easier or lower level cartoons in Japanese if you're trying to do that. Or if you're trying to learn English, you should learn those same things uh, or use that same kind of content in English. It happened out of the blue. Yes, that's correct. Sir had a major, oh, John had a major heart attack. He was in the hospital. And his relative asked the doctor, can he pull through this ailment and get over and pull through the difference? Uh, the illness and the ailment. Well, all right, that's, I don't want to get like too much in the weeds about, about explaining these various phrasal verbs. I, I want to stay on, on topic for this. Uh, but in general, again, you could hear different ex explanations in that same situation. So someone could get through an, uh, an illness or an ailment or something like that, uh, a heart attack, Typically wouldn't be an illness or an ailment. It's, it's just like an actual physical thing that, that goes wrong. So you might have a problem uh, like that. If there's a more technical word for that, people might say that. But you might have a sickness or something. Uh, but to recover is like to pull through, like to, to get through something in the same way. So and this is, again, why hearing lots of different examples about these things, it will make you feel more confident about using them. Because we don't just use only one phrasal verb for each situation. We could have many. But look up more examples of that, and you will find more examples. Uh, and that will make you feel more confident about it. Americans almost always understand British English, vice versa, sometimes in local terms, but usually, but not always. Yeah. All right, uh, additionally, sometimes, okay, still talking about that. Uh, Neomar, hello, I'm from Venezuela. I have a question. I'm a teacher. How can I motivate my students? I want them to speak English and be motivated, but the educational system doesn't help. <laughs> uh, yes, I know, I know how you feel. Um, the best thing you can do is eliminate the doubt because when students feel confident that they understand something, that's when they enjoy it. And this is why people, like students, are playing video games or doing puzzles or things like that because the, they naturally want to do that. So if you can make the lesson more like a puzzle, but you don't give them the answer, you let them try to solve it. 
All right, and so you make the language understandable so they think, ah, now I got it, and they feel much more confident about that. So actually just watch some of my videos and watch what I do for that because what I'm describing is, is like a typical lesson that I do. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not here to try to like tell you to learn or to, to motivate you. It's just, can I make language learning easy and fun? And if you understand it and you're learning, then people will watch the videos and improve. I, that, it, that is the motivation. So I don't need to give extra motivation. People either, either I'm doing a good job of, of teaching and I'm making the language understandable and eliminating doubt, or I'm not doing that. Okay. Uh, let's see. In advance, says I'm copying every single word that came from your mouth. Let's see. The reason why I'm doing this is because I'm enhancing my pronunciation to keep myself on the ball. Yeah. So it's not bad to copy me. That's, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you, you should get lots of examples, which will help with understanding and fluency. Uh, let's see. Elizabeth says, I would like an explanation what closed caption means. Just Google that. <laughs> yeah, you don't need me to explain what closed captions are. Uh, BS says, hello, Drew. Uh, I've just come up with a joke. May I share with you? Go ahead. Or was that the joke? Actually, you're totally right. I've used closed master, but never actually remembered examples they used. A deliberate attempt to really think and understand sentences and terms would have helped me more. Yes. Uh, and this is why I recommend uh, learning fewer words or fewer sentences and really focusing on those. That will help you understand. And over time, your process will speed up because now you can understand way more and you can learn so many new things with those examples. All right. Watching from Somalia. We got uh, Aden and and Osama there. Uh, so the joke goes, well, after watching Drew's videos, after a while, the only thing I'm fluent uh, is speaking about what drawbacks I had before on my way to fluency. <laughs> I see. All right, Eunice says, your body language and the way you move your hands and explaining the lesson is very helpful for me understanding English. I like listening to you, Drew. Glad to hear it. Yes, uh, this is also part of the reason I like video rather than just audio. So you can actually see things. I can draw my poorly drawn examples on the board. Uh, Yusef says, what time is it now in the U.S.? I don't know. I'm not in the U.S. Check Google. Uh, France says, a low. Bolds is a low. Thank you for your patience. Let's see. Marcelo Dios. Why didn't you put all that in one, one name? Oh, my goodness. Marcelo Dias Oliveria. Okay, I think I got that right. And there's a two olive areas on that. Uh, do you think that if a person is not a native speaker, is it possible to become a good English speaker? Yeah, for sure. Why, why not? I'm a good speaker of Japanese, and I'm not, I'm not native. I'm not born here. It's how you learn. How you learn. If how you learn reflects reality, then you will speak like that. It's that simple. All right. Uh, let's see. Azim, you are so beautiful with the heart eyes over there. All right, thank you. Game over, says Yusef. And Mama says uh, hello from Oman. So it's 10.02 in the U.S. So there are actually different time zones in the U.S. Depends on where you live. Body says hi. All right, uh, I think we've gotten to the end of this video. Hopefully everybody gets the idea. Remember, there is a, a natural world of, of like all of, if you can think of your native language, of all the different speakers and the ways they speak and the different speeds and the different vocabulary. The more uh, you learn like this, the more you will speak like this. So if you only get slow examples or they're too fast or something, if you have holes in your learning that don't reflect this, so if you have all these different kinds of speakers, but you only learn with a few different kinds of speakers, then it's going to be more difficult for you to become fluent and to have good conversations and understand people. So the more this matches this, you really want to match these two things, and that's what's going to help you speak fluently. All right, so the mind of a native speaker, we really want to help you get that. You don't need to be a native to think like this. It's just, hey, I need to get more examples that are like the real world, and I really should understand these things and eliminate the doubt that I have, and that's what's going to help me speak. All right, hopefully, let's see any final comments there. I think everybody got it, uh, but thank you very much for the explanation. Many thanks. Yes, and we know the time in Wisconsin. There we go. That must be also the same time in Chicago right now. All right. Well, have a fantastic day. If you'd like to learn uh, how to do this, and I show you step by step actually with lessons that walk you through all this and get you fluent automatically, that's what we do in Fluent for Life. Usually the things I do on YouTube is kind of explaining the principles and I give lots of examples about how to learn. But 
that's how we do it. So click on the links in the description below this video if you'd like to learn more, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.